My name is Aliyah Wessela. I work for the Office of Continuing Education here at the University of Michigan School of Social Work, and I'm recognizing a lot of names that are showing up in our attendee list today. Um, so welcome back to another CE uh, offered session. I'm here at the beginning to do a little bit of housekeeping with you all so you know what you need to do in order to earn CE today. So the first thing you need to do if you're planning to get CE for attending today's session is to stay for the duration of the session. We do ask that you be here the entire time. Um, we will also, because this is a live interactive session, we do have interactive polling opportunities throughout the presentation. So we ask that you, <laughs> excuse me, uh, we ask that you participate in those polls um, to indicate your engagement. And it also is usually helpful to our speakers to learn more about who's in the audience and what your background is. Um, and if you are unable to use the chat function for some reason, please feel free, or if you're unable to use the poll function, please feel free to respond in the chat instead. That will, we also review the chat if you're um, wanting CEs today. Um, we do have chat available, so please you know, feel free to send in questions and comments throughout the session. We also have a question and answer box, which we ask you to use if you have questions for Justin that you would like him to answer before, um, before we wrap up today. So if you have specific questions for Justin, please put those in the question and answer box. Um, you also may notice that we have a live transcript running. Uh, if you see stuff appearing at the bottom of your screen, please know you do have the option to turn that off if you prefer not to see the live transcript. Um, but if you if you benefit from having that available, we do have that available to you. All right. We are recording today's session and it will be available after uh, for your viewing and we will be distributing that. All right. I think that that's all I have to say. I'm gonna reiterate this in the chat as previously stated, and I'm gonna pass it over to Miriam to, to get us started today. Thanks, Aaliyah. I'm Miriam Connolly, president of the Alumni Board of Governors, and I'm honored to be here introducing Justin Hodge. Justin is a clinical assistant professor of social work at the University of Michigan. He works to promote socially just policies through his engagement in governmental and political organizations. He was appointed by the Washtenaw County Board of Commissioners to serve on the Community Action Board and Board of Health. He also serves as chair of the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Community Advisory Board for Law Enforcement, where he brings a social justice perspective to advising on policing. Justin was elected to serve the Washtenaw County community on the executive board of the Washtenaw County Democratic Party, where he provides leadership on state level advocacy issues. Nationally, he served on the board of directors of the Congressional Research Institute for Social Work and Policy, which works to expand the participation of social workers in federal legislative and policy processes. Justin Hodge is dedicated to mental health services on both the policy and individual level. He has provided therapy to children and families, case management to individuals with developmental disabilities, and has coordinated clinics for children in crisis. By leveraging his experiences as both a clinical and macro social work practitioner, he aims to bridge the gap between the two for students. Please join me in welcoming Justin Hodge. Thank you, Miriam, for that very kind introduction. Uh, one other thing I wanna to add to it, which will come up throughout the discussion, I'm happy to answer questions about this. I'm also running for Washtenaw County Commissioner, uh, and that deeply connects to the work that I'm doing around political social work in our school and, um, and in our community. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions or just have a conversation about what that looks like for people as we go. Uh, I'm gonna open up the screen share and then we're gonna get right into the presentation. We've got a lot of content we could go over, but I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if people have questions as we go, um, the questions will be monitored and we'll be able to, uh, I'll answer those as we go and hopefully we can have a conversation. All right. So everybody should be seeing the screen. So I'm gonna talk about the state of political social work and education and practice. Uh, and I'm gonna be looking specifically at what it looks like in education at the University of Michigan School of Social Work. Okay, but first we're gonna get started with a question. All right, I wanna know who's in the room. So this is a yes or no question. Uh, political engagement is only for social workers and macro practice. What do you think? So we'll just give everybody a few more moments to answer. It looks like you guys are getting the hang of it. They're coming in pretty quickly. 
And again, to reiterate, if the polls are not working for you and you would like CE, please feel free to respond to the prompt in the chat. And then Aaliyah, if I'm getting questions as we go, please jump in because with the screen share up like this, I can't see the, the questions. All right, we will be sure to do that. We'll give you guys about 10 more seconds. See a couple of them coming in the chat. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and show you guys the results. Oh, okay, great, we got 100% no, thank you. Okay, I was a little worried there. Uh, if I was gonna have to convince some people that this is for everyone, I, I think uh, my opinions on that are pretty clear given that uh, as my bio mentioned, I used to do uh, clinical social work. Uh, I'm still a licensed clinical social worker, but clearly my work is at the school right now. So here's another question. Do you feel prepared to be politically engaged? So all of you in the room that responded to the poll said you believe that there's a role um, for social workers in political engagement, regardless of what you're doing, uh, but do you feel prepared to be engaged? This time you could also answer not sure. We'll give you guys a couple more seconds. All right, and here are the results. Okay, so a little more of mixed response here. So about 72% of you say yes, you feel prepared. Uh, and then there's some not sure and no's. Uh, which is really understandable because there are so many ways that you can be politically engaged and it's uh i mean it's tough to know um but a lot of people are thinking about that right now with an election huge election 13 days away uh so i'm going to give you some tips throughout this presentation on ways in which you could be more engaged uh, and then happy to answer specific questions as we go but time for another question so do you know who your elected officials are or how to find them this is more important than you may think it is and in this question, I mean people like who your county commissioners might be, or your, or your county commissioner, your city council people, uh, township trustees. Do you know if you don't know who they are? Do you know how to figure out who they are? We're getting these responses really quickly, so that's good. <laughs> um, but we'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, good. All right, so most people do know how to figure that out. Uh, and then we'll talk more about how you could find information about who your elected officials are, because it's important to know who they are, but also a little bit about them. Last question until we get into some of the presentation. Uh, have you ever considered running for elected office? You know, one of the things that I'm always trying to do at the school is getting more social workers to, to run for office, or at least be more engaged politically, especially in electoral politics. So. Um, Many of you are alumni, so I'm hoping that we can get some more alums and current students thinking about running. We'll give you guys about 10 more seconds. Right about 80 percent have participated in this poll. So you got to keep in mind, if you say yes, I'm going to ask later, what have you thought about running for? We do have in the chat, um, someone said yes, but I prefer to stay behind the scenes supporting on campus with other folks. That's, that's very important too. Yeah. Here are the Okay, a lot of no's, a lot of no's. Hopefully I can change your mind before this is over, but I do see some yeses. So uh, we'll get into some conversation later about what are these people that said yes, think about running for or have thought about running for. 
but let's uh, get into it now. So uh, we're gonna go, we're gonna take a look at what political social work is, uh, what it's not, and then look at some of the specifics within um, the field of political social work, and then talk about what that looks like at the University of Michigan. And then we'll, we can talk a little bit more about what that looks like in practice. Um, so political social work is becoming a lot more popular. Uh, people are talking about it a lot more. Um, and what it refers to is really getting social work to be more engaged in, uh, in politics. Uh, and changing the political landscape. So ultimately the goal of political social work is to have social workers involved influencing uh, electoral and policy contexts, and ultimately that will change what politics looks like. So we hear, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about how politics uh, isn't good or people are corrupt or there's, they have no ethics. Well, you know, one way you can go about changing that uh, is by getting more social workers in there because then you know that they're gonna be following the social work code of ethics. So if we can get more social workers to engage in political social work and be engaged in politics, uh, our code of ethics and our values would be infused into politics and that would change the political environment. And that's what um, political social work aims to do. So we talk a lot about um, policy practice in social work. I mean, that's uh, been the focus of a lot of different schools of social work over time. And that's different than what political social work looks like. Uh, so with policy practice, I mean, that's been a fo the focus on that has been on changing policy, uh, largely through advocacy um, or, or looking at policy or doing policy analysis. Political social work difference because it focuses more on uh, the political landscape. You can kind of think of it as uh, political science meets social work. And that differs from policy practice. Uh, of course, they're related and we want social workers being prepared to do both of those. So I gotta always plug this book because um, it's written by one of our alums, Shannon Lane. Uh, so this is one of the books you can see on my bookshelf behind me. Uh, so this is the first book on political social work and it came out in 2018. So you can, I can tell you um, the direction that things are heading in, as a field, uh, but it's a fantastic book. I use parts of it in some of my classes, uh, but if you wanna learn more about political social work, that this is one of the ways you can do that. Uh, and it's fantastic that we have a book written by one of our alum um, about it now. All right, so digging into what political social work looks like more specifically, uh, within political social work, the research looks at five different domains. I know there's six on the screen. Uh, I'll tell you why in a minute. So uh, the key researchers in political social work have looked at engaging individuals and communities in political processes as one of the domains, which that looks like a lot of voter registration or promoting political justice. So getting uh, communities to be more engaged and to increase the um, political power of communities that have been typically disenfranchised. Uh, influencing policy agendas and decision-making. So that's getting people to be more engaged in changing what their elected officials or people that are in policy-making positions are doing. Uh, holding professional staff positions. Uh, so you can think about with that one, people that are working for elected officials or perhaps they're appointed um, officials. So, so the work that I do with the county on the community action board or the board of health, uh, those are holding appointed positions. Engaging with political parties is that sixth one that's not really looked at right now in the research or looked at as its own domain within political um, social work practice. So I include that one when I have discussions about it. As you heard in my bio, I've done a lot of work with the Washington County Democratic Party and I've done a lot of work with political parties more broadly. Uh, and I think that's an area that's uh, really not looked at enough as social workers as a way to make change in politics. Uh, and then of course there's engaging with political campaigns, which a lot of people are thinking about right now with whether you're volunteering on a campaign or you're a paid staff person, and of course running for office. So basically anything you can think of engaging uh, in political social work would fit into one of these six domains. There's a lot of research around the five uh, that I mentioned, and then the other one political parties is one that I'm looking to have people put more focus on. So to go into the specifics of each one, um, as I mentioned with this first one, doing outreach to uh, voters and underrepresented groups. Uh, so we wanna empower voters that are not really engaged um, in their democracy or in our democracy as much as they could be. Uh, you know, we have a representative democracy and it only functions as it's designed when everybody's working to make their voices heard. So as social workers, we do have a responsibility to help make sure that people are reflected in what our government is doing. So you can do this in, uh, through voter registration uh, and advocating on behalf of clients to increase uh, clients or underrepresented groups. I mean, that, those kinds of activities would fit into this domain. And really, this is the domain that I think most social workers, regardless of what you're doing as your day job, uh, could, could do. Like this is everyone should be doing voter registration all year round. That's something I really think, uh, um, especially nonprofits. And I even like to see uh, government agencies, including voter registration as part of their intake process for anybody that sees clients. Uh, because there's always this concern around, can a nonprofit do, or how much political activity can a nonprofit do? Voter registration is not a political activity. So everyone could do voter registration. Uh, I mean, it's one of the easiest ways to help promote and protect our democracy. 
influencing policy agendas. So uh, this one overlaps with some of the other ones. So if you're working on a campaign or you're doing a lot of work with an elected official, you're in a position to potentially influence uh, their agenda. Um, and you're also able to influence the agenda of people that are in office or people that are running or even who runs for office. Um, so when you're out there encouraging people, and hopefully many of you do encourage people to, uh, to, to run for office, uh, you're having an impact on changing what policy may look like. Engaging with political parties. So this is one, uh, people don't think a lot about this one. This is the one I want people to think more about is that you know political parties, uh, this often gets overlooked when we have the big uh, nationwide conventions. But a big part of that is uh, them passing the party platform. So what the political party stands for. And even the, you know, the smaller political parties like the Green Party and Libertarian Party, they have platforms too. And uh, one thing I always have my students take a look at is looking at those in more detail. Uh, but so what does the party stand for? What kind of actions are they going to take? Those things are outlined uh, in the in the party's platform. And as social workers, if we're engaged with political parties, we can have a say on what uh, issues are important to parties. Uh, other opportunities you have with engaging with political parties involve supporting candidates up and down the ticket. So a lot of focus tends to be on national uh, people that are running for national office, like, of course, the president, uh, who your U.S. senator is and your congressperson. And I mean, Obviously, since I'm someone that's running for local office, I put a lot of focus on uh, local government, um, but not just because it's, I think, more accessible to people, but also because the things that happen at your local government levels affect your life on a day-to-day -day basis more so than things at the higher, the top of the ticket. Um, so it's important to be engaged with your local political party so you can have that kind of engagement with the people that are making those kinds of decisions. Uh, and then depending on the political party that you're engaged with, uh, you might they might do community education or provide services. Uh, so um, in Washtenaw County, the work I do with the Washtenaw County Democratic Party, uh, our party does a lot of community education events around um, in voter registration events, um, also does other things like gathering, uh, we do canned food drives, all kinds of things. And it's, some of those are unusual for some political parties to do. Um, but I mean, if you get social workers in leadership, there can be those different kinds of things that people don't expect a political party to do. Once I get through all of these, we're gonna, I want to open it up for some questions or thoughts about them. Um, so holding staff appointments. Uh, so a lot of people think about, when you think about people that work for the state government or the federal government, they're in civil service positions. Uh, that You're going to be doing a lot of policy work in those kinds of positions, not much political um, work. Of course, there are political appointments too, where elected officials can typically have um, room to give certain people the job, and those are called political appointments. And then serving an appointed office. Uh, so as I mentioned before, thinking about uh, how you, all of you, I would recommend that you do this, look at your uh, city and county governments and see what um, opportunities there are to serve in different uh, appointed positions. Uh, just to give you an example of how you know, impactful those positions can be, when I lived in the city of East Lansing, I was on the equivalent of their civil rights commission. Uh, and during my time on that uh, commission, I was able to write the ordinance that got the city to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day uh, instead of Columbus Day. And then so we were able to give that to the city council person that was assigned to the commission. Uh, and it took quite a while, but it went through council and eventually the city made that change. Uh, so I mean, that's the kind of influence you can have on policy, even at a really local level and it not being your day job. Uh, and most, uh, especially in Michigan, uh, cities and counties tend to have a lot of different appointed um, boards and commissions that residents can be on. Uh, townships tend to have fewer, but they tend to have some at least. Uh, and of course, working for an elected official. Um, if you're looking at the state level, there are fewer opportunities for that. Most state representatives and state senators have two or three staff people. But if you're looking at um, nationally, people have much larger staffs. Okay, and then looking at engaging with electoral campaigns. So I'm sure at this point in the election cycle, many of you have received a ton of text messages or phone calls from people's campaigns, uh, either asking you for money, asking who you're voting for, uh, trying to get you to make sure you get your absentee ballot on time, all of that. So that's, uh, I mean, there are real people doing that work. And it, it's time consuming, but very helpful um, to people's campaigns. So that's, you know, working on and volunteering on campaigns, especially when you're looking at local level, uh, people tend not to have hired staff. Um, so a lot of this relies on people that can give up some of their time to do that. Um, another thing that I like for people to think more about is ballot initiatives. So whenever you go to vote, uh, typically in the November election, so the bigger one, there's usually a ballot initiative or two on there. Uh, and a lot of the, the way that those get on the ballot is a lot of the same techniques that are used by candidates for campaigning. I mean, you've got to get information out there. Uh, and you, I mean, the language has to be approved, but then um, it's, it's convincing people to vote yes or no on it. Um, 
of course, doing voter education about policy issues and electoral campaigns. So you can be, you could work outside of a campaign and provide information on candidates or issues uh, as a way to be engaged in the electoral process, but without it working directly with a candidate. And then, and then as I mentioned earlier, influencing candidates that actually run for office, which is really important. Um, you know, it's a lot less work to get someone in office that you know is going to be in line with your values and make policy decisions that you agree with and it is to try to get someone that's been in office for a really long time uh, to change what they're going to do. And then the last uh, domain is, I mean, there's two things that go in there, running and serving an elected office, which are different. They require a really different set of skills. And I think um, if, if you feel like, as many people do, that Washington is dysfunctional uh, or that even your state and local elected officials aren't you know, doing what you'd like for them to be doing. Some of that has to do with the skills that it takes to run for office are different than the ones uh, that it takes to serve an office effectively. And there are a lot of people that are in office that don't have the skill set for both of those things. So that's another thing to think about as you're thinking about you yourself running or trying to encourage other people to run as well. I think we have a question. Yep, here's okay. So after this question, we're gonna get into some discussion. Uh, what domains of political social work practice are you willing to engage in now? You collect, uh, select all of them that you're willing to do. And then I want to hear some specifics from people. Either things that you've already done, things that you're interested in doing. Just a reminder to everyone that if you are not able to use the polling function, you are welcome to respond via the chat. Additionally, any questions that you have for Justin, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box or in the chat at any time. Um, and Aliyah and I will do our best to relay those to Justin. All right, let's do it. Do we have any questions in there for me or comments that people have so far? Not at this moment, but it looks like we are opening the floor for some questions, everyone. So please send us um, some questions that you have. And we're gonna give you a few more seconds um, on the poll. And while we're waiting, um, we have someone that commented in the chat, Justin, um, Christine, she says, working heavily on proposed revisions to the, De to the Detroit Charter right now. Okay. That's really important work. All right. We, all right. Well, all of them got at least one vote. So there are a lot of, 83% of you said that you'd be willing to do engage, um, work around engaging individuals and communities and political processes. So that's good. So doing voter registration work. And you know, I think I was spot on in thinking that that's the one that most social workers could get behind. Um, smallest one, of course, was seeking and holding elected office. Uh, it's not always fun. It's not always fun. And let's see, holding professional and political staff positions. I could see that one is, I mean, that was the second lowest because that one involves I mean, potentially changing what your day job is. Uh, interestingly, we got almost an equal number here, people that are uh, willing to engage with political parties or with electoral campaigns. And then of course, influencing policy agendas and decision makings. So, so that's, yeah, I mean, you do a lot of that with, many of you give to the NASW or you are a member of the NASW and you're giving money to them and they're working to influence policy agendas. Excellent. Okay, so this is a, I wanna keep the floor open because after this, we're gonna transition from talking about what political social work is uh, into looking at what our school has been doing around political social work recently. And as many of you are alum, I, I was uh, thinking that you would find some of the changes and the things that we're doing uh, pretty interesting. But I do wanna hear from people that have said that they're interested in uh, running for office or being engaged in other ways to share a bit about that. We do have um, two questions in the chat. One, how can retired social workers get involved? That's a great question. Yeah, I mean, retired social workers uh, should definitely be involved. When we look at a lot of people that are volunteering for political campaigns or doing any of this other kind of work, it's frequently people that are retired. Uh, you know, you could get engaged with a political party. I would say look at, I tend to like county, um, political, county level political parties um, as a way to engage because it's just local enough. Um, but also it has that broader reach. So I would say Google the uh, political party of your choice uh, at the county level and then um, see when the next meeting is. I mean, everybody's meeting on Zoom right now, so it's a good way to get involved. I know that with ours, with the Washington County Democratic Party, we've got a ton of different ways in which volunteers can be involved because uh, we have a ton of different committees that do a bunch of different things. So my bio um, mentioned that I do a lot of work around state level advocacy. 
Um, so we figure out bills that are coming up that we either think are good or think are bad after uh, consulting with different people. And then we work to get um, phone banking going or other ways to do advocacy around that. But there's plenty of other things. And, um, that Whatever skills you have, there's going to be a way to use them. Uh, I mean, we've got, of course, a communications team. So if you've got skills around communications, that's also really helpful. Um, and then volunteering for political campaigns is always helpful. I mean, no campaign is going to turn away volunteers because, uh, I mean, you need it. And people tend to really focus on the campaigns like a month or two before the election, but campaigns tend to be working well before that too. So there's something to do there. And I would say if you're retired and you also want to do uh, some of that more hands-on policy work, look at getting appointed to different boards and commissions in, in your community. Uh, there, I didn't say this earlier, but there are state level ones too. So the way you can think about these different boards and commissions is kind of like, you know, how Congress people tend to, I mean, they're assigned to a bunch of different committees. It's like that, except it's for residents. And then there's usually one elected official, one or two assigned to each one that the residents advise uh, the elected official on. So how I mentioned, I'm on the board of health. Uh, there are uh, county commissioners that are assigned to that. And then there are a bunch of other residents that have a particular area um, that, that's within their area of expertise. And then we advise the health department or the, uh, and the commissioners that come to that on those kinds of issues. So those, and those aren't a huge time commitment for people either. They tend to be, uh, they tend to be about once a month. Uh, and then there's some work in between, but that's also, I think, a great way to be involved in making some um, policy change in your community. Do you want to answer a couple more questions? Do we have some time? Oh yeah, we got time. We got time to answer questions. Perfect. I want this to be as interactive as possible. Yeah. Awesome. But it's harder when All they right. can't talk, but. <laughs> that is true, yeah. Um, okay, so is holding elected office at a lower level valid, um, a valid first step, something like your condo board? Oh yeah, I mean, a lot of these things are structured just like, uh, I mean, you probably had to campaign for a uh, condo board. Uh, and I'm talking to a lot of students right now because student union elections are coming up. Uh, so I mean, the, the principles are the same. You have to campaign and then you get to see you're looking at policy at the condo board level. Uh, that's a great first step. And it looks like we do oh, have some. Cool that's a good one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, that's OK. Um, it looks like we do have some alums that are getting involved. We have one um, working on the Biden campaign canvassing. Um, and she says she's really enjoying it. Um, we have another person who is the president of the local Washtenaw Abudan Society um, advocacy for environmental issues. Um, and it's what I work on all the time. So that is, that is pretty cool. And then we have another question. How do we get voters to cross, to cross party line and make all political parties pay attention to their concerns, not be taken for granted by one party? Oh, that's a that's a hard question. Uh, so I'll do my best to answer that one. I mean, part of that, I don't know if there's going to be a really good answer to getting people to, to cross party line. And that when you go back and you look at the platforms for different political parties, which is something that more people need to look at, you're going to see that, I mean, the values of the different parties are very different. I mean, you can tell what's in something and what's and why something might not appear in there. Uh, I mean, a lot of the, the work in politics comes down to relationships and what people's values are. And the political parties value different things. And as a result of that, there's, uh, I mean, action or inaction from different parties. Uh, I'd like to hear specifically, like, what maybe an issue that you're thinking of and how we might be able to frame it in a way to get more interest around it. Um, and then while I wait for that to come in, another thing I would say is that, you know, whether you voted for a person or not, and they are your elected official, I mean, you're still there constituent. I mean, you should still meet with that person. You should call them. Uh, and I mean, and you should be having a, a, a dialogue with them and they should listen to what their constituents are saying. And if they're not, if it's, if it's a person that's really not going to listen to what their constituents are saying, then I mean, my response to that is you got to get them out of there. You got to keep in mind, elected officials work for you where they're supposed to. So while we're waiting, that was that question was from Georgia. So Georgia, if you want to specify um, in the chat or you can send it in the Q&A, um, I'll make sure to pass that on to Justin. Um, but while we're waiting, we are still getting quite a few people um, talking about how they're involved. And just to clarify, um, the Abu Dhabi Society is advocacy for birds and environment. So Juliet, that's really great work that you're doing um, for our environment. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, it's we only get one earth. I mean, it's pretty scary with uh, how little uh, 
attention we're paying to climate issues because I mean, social work too, we care about that. I mean, we're not gonna be able to have social justice um, unless we have environmental justice. And we have Christine saying, um, Christine, I believe this is what your, oh, your black club does. So Christine is very active in her black club. When I first read that, I thought it's a book club. Um, but so they do a lot of work with the state legislator, um, but it's frustrating and very difficult to advance legislation that supports immigrant communities or black anti-immigrant legislation. You know, that that is a challenge that we've run into too. And I mean, part of my response with that is it's, you know, it's unfortunate when we get into a situation where we can't advance legislation that's gonna help a lot of people. And part of the issue is that when we get people in office, it, like I said, with uh, it's harder to get somebody that's already in office to do something that's outside of their values. It's it's easier to get somebody in there that is more in line with your values and will and will advance policies that you want to see. So that's one of the reasons why social workers really need to be engaged politically. It's not enough to do policy advocacy. It's we need to have the policymakers in position, people, social workers, and other people that share our values to be in policymaking positions uh, so we can see the policies that we need to see to help um, protect our communities. I'm going to move it along, but we'll keep taking questions as they come in. I want to tell people a bit about uh, what's going on at the school, uh, and then we can get some, I'm sure there'll be questions about that too. So I'm happy to answer questions about things that took place before this part of the presentation and, and further in. So first, I have to talk about what's going on in continuing education uh, and, of course, put a plug out for this. So we have an online certificate in political social work. Uh, this is many of you are here getting CEUs. and If you want some more CEUs and want to learn about how to be more politically engaged, uh, we have a 28 hour um, program for you that can be done purely asynchronously, except you have to do one hour of live Q&A with me before uh, it's over. Uh, so we you know, we spent some time developing this over um, a few years. Uh, it started off as me doing a one day workshop on political social work at the school. Uh, and then we were able to evolve that into a certificate program that we continued refining into this version of it that we're now offering. Uh, it's offered year round. So, you know, if you're really interested in the things that I talked about today and, you're, and you wanna learn more about how you can get engaged, I would highly recommend this. Uh, not just because I'm the certificate program director, but because I think the content is fantastic. Uh, I really worked to recruit people um, across the country that are experts in the different topics that we cover. So I'm gonna give you just a bit of information about this. And Aaliyah, of course, jump in um, about it. So we have three different um, modules within the certificate program. Uh, and you can see on the screen um, what, what each of the lectures, the topics are in there. Uh, so this first one really focuses on research and theory behind political social work practice. Um, you're going to hear from the people that wrote the book on political social work in some of these lectures, um, and you'll hear from many other people too. We'll, and oh, and that last one you hear from Senator Chang. She's a uh, part of the certificate program too, so she'll give you that inside perspective. Um, so an alum of our program, um, that's a social worker that's in the state senate right now. This one is bigger. I, there's more lectures in this part, and we ex expect to expand this one over time. So this one gives you more tools for how do you engage in political social work practice. So that first one focuses on theories uh, and principles, and then this one focuses on specific things that you can do. So you'll learn about activism, uh, building coalitions. You'll learn about, let's say you're a, a clinical social worker. How can you, what kind of political social work can you do in your workplace? Um, I can give you an example of that from when I was doing clinical social work. So I was working at uh, in a community mental health system during the time when Governor Snyder and the state legislature slashed the budget to mental health services. And you know, we're still as a state struggling from those cuts because they haven't been reversed. And as a result of that change, one of the things that we had to do was um, let a lot of clients go without a really strong or any transition plan in some cases. Uh, and really that experience working as a clinical social worker in that setting is what pushed me to get more engaged in politics because I got to looking at the people that are in these different positions of power that have uh, that are making decisions that have extreme impacts on people's lives. Um, so then after that happened, I started looking at, well, who uh, is really running CMH or making some of these other uh, monumental decisions at the more local level? And depending on the CMH that you're at, uh, whether it's one that serves one county or multiple counties, if it's one that serves multiple counties, the board of the board of directors tends to be a few county commissioners from each of the counties and then a few other elected officials uh, and then maybe a stakeholder or two. But frequently it's not people that have uh, 
training or their social in this work or, or their social workers. Um, so that got me looking at um, local office and the kind of work that, that can be done there. Um, but to give you an example, something that you might want to do if you're paying attention to policies that are being looked at at your workplace um, and it would be relevant to your clients, you could make them aware that, hey, our board of directors is going to be looking at issue X. Uh, and it may affect your services, you might want to come and make your voice heard. That's a totally fine thing to do. Uh, you only get into a, a not so good area when you start telling people how to vote or what to do. But when you're providing information, which is something we should be doing as social workers and making people aware of how to exercise their rights, uh, that's totally in line with what you can do. So you'll learn more about that in, uh, in that political social work in the workplace lecture. Um, and of course, branding. I really think the branding and the public discourse lectures, those ones are helpful regardless of what you're doing and branding yourself professionally is very important. And then this last module that we have in the program is this uh, special knowledge areas and we expect to expand this one over time. So this one does a deeper dive into different uh, topic areas that would be relevant for um, political social workers to know about. Um, so we've got one on combating fake news, which I mean, you hear plenty about that from the president. So you know, it's important uh, to know about that. Uh, I have this lecture in here about uh, political parties, so you can learn more about how you can get engaged there and the, the work that's going on there. Social work and immigration, and we have uh, climate change and environmental justice one as well. So there is a lot of, and we expect to expand this one over time, so you'll get to learn more about different topic areas. But that's our um, continuing education certificate program. It is also open to uh, non-social workers, and we have gotten quite a few non-social workers in it. Um, but would love to have our alum, you know, engage in this content since many of you graduated before you were able to experience political social work in the MSW program. Any thoughts or questions about that, or Aaliyah, do you want to jump in about the program? Oh, I just wanted to say that I posted the link uh, in the chat for anyone who might be interested. And my office is happy to answer any questions anyone has at any time about the program. So thanks for the plug, Justin. Yep. Any thoughts or questions about this part of it? So this is just giving you a sense of, and this is, uh, I'm gonna show you what we're doing in the MSW program next, but we've been doing this work in continuing education uh, for a lot longer. I mean, this is uh, really the first uh, big step towards engaging political social work that the um, school of social work has taken. The work in CE is always cutting edge. Thanks. <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, it does not appear we have any questions about this at this time. So if you want to continue, I'm gonna on. keep it going. People are just so interested they don't have questions. That's great. Okay. So oh, next, wait, there is one. Oh, okay, there is one. Okay. Can you say a couple of quick points you make in the session to combat fake news? Yeah. Uh, so in that one, I don't teach that one. I, of course, I can give you some quick points, but. Um, our social work librarian teaches that one. So, I mean, it's, it's a great, it's, it's great because, I mean, she's a librarian and knows all the, everything you need to know about finding that. But I would say you want to know what news sources are reputable uh, and, and knowing, so you can spot fake news because if you know which ones are reputable, you know which ones are not. And then make sure that you're sharing news from people that, uh, to people from those reputable sources. And then trying to have a conversation, if you're having a conversation with someone that's consuming a lot of fake news, uh, you wanna try to keep it focused on the facts more than um, like people's impression of them. Uh, it can be very difficult because this is, I mean, fake news is contributing to this issue that we have where it seems like people are operating uh, in an entirely different reality. Um, but knowing where you can get reputable news uh, and sharing that and then making sure that you talk you know, as best you can from a factual standpoint when you're in a disagreement with someone about um, fake fake news and looking at multiple sources and encouraging other people to look at multiple sources. sources. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, next I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what political social work looks like now uh, in the MSW program. So as many of you may have heard, uh, we have launched uh, pathways. There are new, like the equivalent of concentrations and, or majors, if, depending on when you're here at the School of Social Work. Um, and if you were here not that long ago uh, or, or long ago, uh, policy and program evaluation were the same concentration that we have this new one that's policy and political social work. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, what students are learning in this new pathway uh, and how that can be used for them to develop professionally. 
So all the pathways uh, in our new curriculum are 12 credits. Um, students will have the option to be able to take two pathways, depending on how many elective credits they have left over, um, or to use their elective credits to dive deeper into a pathway. Our policy and political social work pathway has three three credit required courses, which are listed here. And I'm going to tell you a bit about each one of those. Uh, and we also have that, that leaves students with three credits that they have to use for pathway approved courses. Um, so that could be other policy or political focused courses we have at the School of Social Work, uh, or it could be some outside of the School of Social Work. Um, you know, most schools and colleges across the university have some policy course. Uh, so I always encourage students to you know, take, take at least one course outside the School of Social Work so they can get experience working um, with people from other disciplines. Uh, so this first course that we have here is called Theories and Principles of Socially Just Policies. So this course uh, gives students a theoretical background uh, in what makes um, you know, socially just policy making happen uh, and what should be included in policies that are addressing social justice. Our hope in designing this course uh, is that students will be able to take it and then they'll be prepared to go take a policy or a political focus course in any other school across the university. And because when we find that when students do that, uh, the perspective is very different. I mean, the other people are not teaching policy courses with social justice first. You know, at, at the center of whatever they're teaching. Taking this course will allow students to stay grounded in social justice uh, as they take policy courses in other schools. Um, then there's methods for socially just policy analysis. So that's a policy analysis course um, that I teach that focuses on giving students the tools to um, you know, make briefs um, or other policy documents and engage in um, successful policy writing. And this is really for students that maybe want to be a policy analyst at some point. I've had plenty of students um, use um, writing samples from this course when I was like developing the course and teaching it in previous semesters, uh, use those writing samples to get policy analysis, uh, analyst jobs. Um, so that's really the focus of that one is giving people concrete skills that they can use uh, in the workplace. And then the last course is the political social work course. And that course focuses on giving students the tools to engage in those different domains of political social work practice that I went over earlier in the presentation. Um, and the, all of the projects for that class are really hands on. Uh, as with the policy analysis class, I want students to create deliverables that are to be used somewhere in the community. Um, so for example, with policy analysis class, I frequently get students that will uh, engage with state legislators or their offices to figure out what might be something that's useful for their office um, for the student to create. They have to create a brief and then they can pick another policy document of their choice to create. Uh, so then I work with them throughout the semester to refine it to the point where it's something that I'm proud of and they're proud of, and then they can give it to the legislator or someone else. Many people create things to give to advocacy organizations. The political social work uh, course focuses on getting students uh, out in the community and doing some sort of work in one of those political social work domains. Any questions about any of that? That's, uh, that's what our political social work curriculum is looking like now um, at School of Social Work. I'm really excited uh, and grateful to have been a part of helping to develop this new pathway that we have. Um, and students seem to be very excited about having this option to engage in political social work. Prior to having this, I did have some students that would uh, take our CE certificate program. Um, and I still want students to do that, certainly after they graduate, because there's different content in the certificate program. But I'm really glad that we have uh, a greater focus on policy and political social work in our MSW program. We do have some questions coming in. Um, so does this course talk about some of the trade-offs that happen in policy making, how good policy can get watered down in order to some aspects, in order to some aspects past? Does that make yep. sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. So that that's uh, we give students a very real perspective of what it looks like. Uh, our hope is between the three three credit classes that they have to take here and then the additional coursework that they're going to do that they will be competitive for policy um, focused jobs after graduation, knowing that they're going to be competing with people with an MP MPP or other degree. Uh, so, I mean, to do that, we have to be real with what reality looks like for them. Uh, and of course, all of this happens in conjunction with field placement. So in developing this pathway, uh, we've been working really hard to create field placements uh, in more political settings. Like, for example, I've gotten um, a couple of state legislators to become field sites for our students and um, local government. We have local governments that are uh, field sites as well and local government officials. You know, after I win my election in November, uh, next year I'll start taking field students at my office as county commissioner too. Um, we have two other questions. Um, so the first is, have a lot of students signed up for this pathway? Yeah, you know, so my class is, so this semester I'm teaching the 
um, policy analysis course and the next semester I'll be teaching the other two courses and the class is full. So the we have about, I think, 20 students from this incoming class that have picked it as their pathway, but many other students that are picking or that are going to take the other classes uh, either to try to take a second pathway or because they're interested in the content. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with our current, the current number of students that we have um, that have selected it as their primary um, pathway. Um, and I expect that the number is going to increase over time. The second question, um, it's from the same person. How does this pathway um, complement or compete with a master's of public policy? It's a great question. So Kristen Seafeld is my co-pathway lead for this. Um, and she's also in the public policy school. Uh, so we've been really thoughtful with how we've designed the classes and what classes and content we decided to make required. Uh, so all the pathways, if you want to look at what the school is doing now and you want to look at all the pathways, they require differing amounts of required courses. Uh, I mean, there's one pathway that picks 12, all 12 of the credits for the student. There's some pathways that pick six of the credits for the students. We um, selected these three courses because the, the theory and principles class gives students that theoretical background um, that will keep them solidly focused in social work and social justice as they do policy work. The policy analysis class really gives them that policy focus. Uh, and then the political social one gives them the, the political focus one. So you're getting policy and politics and then the theory that goes with both of them. And then you have, a, um, along with field, because field you know, is a significant portion of the program, uh, and it's putting students in you know, places that MPP students would also be in. But I mean, the benefit to our field placement is that it's so long. So there are, uh, for example, MPP students that might be in a state legislator's office for an internship, uh, but not, that's over a summer. Um, I mean, we get students that get to intern with a state legislator or other um, person in politics or policy for an entire year, typically. Um, so they get more of that hands-on experience. And then they have those elective credits that they can choose to use to dive deeper into this work. Um, so, I mean, I always recommend the students that I advise that if they're really serious about this, they should consider using some of those, those elective credits to do that. And that looks like the only questions that we have um, specific to this pathway and the CE course at this time. Oh, are there other questions? I'm happy to answer them. I'm going to yes, jump. Yes, we do. We oh, do yeah. actually have quite a few other questions if you want. We can start. Yeah, um, throw them at me. Let's, let's answer some questions. Okay. Um, so one that someone asked a little bit ago, um, they're interested in knowing a bit more about um, why your path in policy slash social work and what inspired you. Yeah. That's a great question. So when I was getting my MSW here, I was, um, you know, inspired by taking the Social Work 530 course. Uh, and then I took, I mean, then the other required class, uh, policy class that I had to take. So I knew I wanted to do something policy related, but at that point, I really wanted to be a clinician. Uh, I had been doing paraprofessional work at community mental health uh, near where I lived. I lived in Lansing at the time. Um, but knew I wanted to do something like that. So then I took a course in the, uh, used one of my electives to take a course in the School of Public Policy. Um, and then after I graduated and I, and I was doing my field placement at Community Mental Health. So I got hired by my field placement to do clinical work. Um, I was doing that for quite a while. Um, but then how I mentioned with, while I was doing clinical work at Community Mental Health and then seeing that impact um, that the governor and the state legislature had and continues to have on people, that got me more looking seriously at how can I, with my perspective as a social worker, make some of these changes. And then talking to my colleagues when I was working there, a lot of people weren't really paying attention to what was going on from, from a policy perspective. Uh, and a lot of people look at it as like, well, we can't do anything about it. But I mean, that's just not, that's not true. I and mean, we have to make our voices heard and engage with our elected officials. So I um, mean, after those changes happened, um, and then I looked more locally and saw how much power after the state made their budget cuts, but then locally, like county commissions had over the CMH system. I started looking at that, and then I worked to get appointed to different um, boards and commissions. So that's when I got appointed to that civil rights commission that I mentioned. Uh, and at that point, I'm still doing clinical social work, and I'm just doing that, like serving on that commission on the side. Uh, and while I was on there, I was the only social work social worker that was there or had been there. Uh, which was really troubling for me because you would think with the Civil Rights Commission, you would expect there to be a lot of social workers or for social work to be uh, like really prevalent there. And that wasn't the case. So I would get into, you know, discussions or arguments with some of the other um, commissioners on that commission about uh, like our investigation and civil rights complaints or how we should go about doing certain things. And then after that, um, the city asked me to be on this other commission that was responsible for looking for distributing grant funding to social service agencies um, from the federal government. 
And again, you would think social workers would be front and center on that too. And then they weren't, I was the only one that was on there. And then that one um, really, I mean, got me worked up because I'm getting into arguments with lawyers and business people because they're the people that tend to be on these commissions uh, or in elected office about how much money we should give to these different agencies that I work with in my professional role as a social worker and know a bit more about. Um, so at that point, that's when I started thinking um, about coming into or trying to get into academia uh, because I look back on my time in the program and thought, well, if I, if I had more training in policy and political social work, uh, I would like be, I think, further along where I, with where I was at at that point in my political career. But also, if there was more policy and political social work front and center in a program, we would have more social workers in these spaces. Because at that point, it's just lonely. You don't want to be the only social worker in all these spaces all the time. Uh, so that's when I had you know, wrote up a bunch of different ideas, ways in which the school could engage in policy and political social work never really expected any of this stuff to happen or really to have the job that I have right now. Uh, but the, it all started with continuing education and doing that workshop uh, and then expanding into the certificate program. Clearly the school liked a lot of the um, policy and political social work curriculum that I wanted to, to bring to the school. And that's, that's really how I ended up here. Uh, and, you know, continuing to I mean, serve in different appointed positions um, in the Washtenaw County community and running for Washtenaw County Commissioner. I also ran in 2018. I uh, was unsuccessful that time. I was running against a, like a 30 year incumbent or somebody that had been in office for more than 30 years at that particular seat. So it was an uphill battle. Got it this time. Uh, the race was really interesting. Everybody wants to look into it, uh, but it was able to pull off the win in the primary uh, and then the general, I'm not, general election, I'm not worried about. So my ultimate goal um, both right now, professionally and politically, is to get more social workers to engage in policy and political work. And my, I mean, the way I'm, that I'm trying to do that is by teaching at the school, developing programming uh, like this, and then being an elected official and providing students with opportunities uh, to, you know, be in a county commissioner's office as their field placement and really get a sense for how local government works. So my hope is that being an elected official, uh, students, faculty person, in many cases, their advisor, they're going to see that this is something they can really do too. Uh, so that's that's how I got where I'm at. Um, thank you for sharing that. And before I ask another question, I just want um, to mention that you're getting some very grateful messages in the chat. People uh, thanking you for the work that you're doing and looking forward to seeing what else you're going to contribute in your career. No, it's really nice. I look forward to reading those messages. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another question um, is NASW Michigan State legislative work effective? I think it is. I mean, I think it's it's important to have NASW uh, doing the work that they're doing around policy advocacy, but also you know, recognizing the reality that Michigan right now is one of the most gerrymandered states in the country. That won't be the case uh, after the nonpartisan redistricting commission does its work and we uh, don't have such terrible gerrymandering. I mean, there's only so much uh, that we're able to do around advocacy, because again, it goes back to what well, we need to elect better people if we want better policy, but it's hard to do that when uh, things are stacked against you. I mean, if you look back at the election in 2018, where the Democrats won all of the statewide seats in, in the state uh, and are still in the minority in the legislature, that just doesn't, I mean, that, that is only possible because of gerrymandering. So I think NASW is doing um, great work around advocating for the issues that are important to us as social workers at the state level. Um, and I think they'll be even more effective after we're not a gerrymandered state anymore. Okay, um, I think we have time for about one more question and then um, we can move on and then we'll, we'll save some later. Um, so this person would like your thoughts on so social workers working with police departments and best practices in which to use them. Yeah, that's a good question. So, I mean, as you heard in my bio that I chair the Sheriff's Community Advisory Board for Law Enforcement, which is, uh, you know, it's like a police, it's a police advisory board. Uh, and then the Washtenaw County Sheriff, who gets tons of national attention for being a really great police department. President Obama recently retweeted something or tweeted something to, uh, about the success of the Washtenaw County Sheriff's Office. And one of the reasons why I think the office is so successful is because they do a lot of work with social workers. So they have a community engagement a specialist who's an alum of our programs, a social worker. Uh, I think there's a, I think right now there's a lot of conversation around the role of social work and police. And there are some politicians that are pushing this idea that social workers should replace the police or, or should be the police or something like that. That's not, um, you know, that, that's not what I would lean towards. I think that 
we have the current system that we have right now. I think social work can be very useful in changing that and working towards changing it. Um, like I think about programs, there's a program um, in another state called the Cahoots program where in nonviolent, potentially emergency situations, um, social workers are sent out instead of police. So no police are sent out at all. Uh, I think working towards things like that could be really helpful um, where people are less I don't want to say reliant on the police, but the police are called less often because there's a lot of situations that no matter how much de-escalation training or other kinds of training that, that the police get, it's not their role to do some of those things. Like ultimately they're still, I mean, they're trained from a certain perspective, a law enforcement perspective. Um, so I think there's a role in social work playing that reduces the, the need for police. Um, and that gets into some of the defund the police argument that people talk about where whether is it defund the police or shift funding somewhere else. So I think there is a role, uh, and I think it differs depending on the community and how collaboratively uh, you're able to work with different police forces. Uh, we have two more questions. Do you want to answer those or move on? I'll answer the two questions and then move on. We've got time. Great. All right. So the first one, um, they would like you to provide some examples of reputable news outlets. Oh, okay. Examples of repeated. Yeah, you know, those are, those are good. That's a good question. Uh, you know, CNN is good, despite what the president says. Uh, there's a website called Flipside where they give you the same news article from like a left perspective, a right perspective, and then one that they think is center. So that's a good one. And of course, you know, Vox is fantastic. There's a lot of um, like they're they call themselves like the explanatory journalist because they do a lot of great work explaining issues. Um, so I would say if you haven't been looking at Vox or The Atlantic, I say look at those. Uh, New York Times, Washington Post. If you're looking more locally or state of Michigan news, you want to look at Bridge. Uh, not a lot of options beyond M Live, but of course, Michigan Radio, uh, WEMU. WEMU does a good job at focusing, it's EMU's NPR station but they do a lot of focusing on Washtenaw County issues. So if you're looking for Washtenaw County stuff, look at WEMU, look at State of Michigan stuff, look at Bridge uh, and Michigan Radio. And uh, U of M, we have, the university has a library guide uh, on fake news and good news sources that I can have, uh, that I'm sure like Aaliyah could send out after this, right? We're able to send attendees resources, right? Yes, we can do that. Just remind me and we will send that out with the recording. I was, we will send out a good list of them with a the recording. Perfect. All right, so our final question for now, um, can you talk about managing polarization even when people are on the same side? See, that's, that's a tough one, right? I mean, because right now we live in a really polarized time. And, you know, the, ultimately a lot of these things come down to people's values and people value, I think you get to a core value, people share a lot of the core values. I mean, people want enough food and uh, money to take care of their families uh, and people want to be safe and so on. Uh, it's not good to be in an echo chamber. Uh, that's why when back to the news question, I look at all kinds of news sources. Sometimes I have to stop it for a while. Like, you know, I got to see what Fox News is saying about a certain thing uh, or how they're framing it. And sometimes when I go real wild, you can look at what Breitbart is saying. Uh, I don't really check what Infowars is saying. This, that's just too much to the right. Uh, but you want to be able to try to understand things from these different perspectives, because when we talk about polarization, a lot of the polarization is coming from where people are getting their information. And inherently, people are seeing different things because it's being represented to them differently. So. I think that one of the areas, this is one of the areas where social work can be really helpful because you know we're trained to work with people uh, and, and to look at things from their perspective. And if we can do that in these kinds of really difficult political and polarized conversations, we could find some sort of common ground or at least a place to get to a, a agree to disagree, but not hate each other sort of place. A really great response um the not hate each other kind of place um <laughs> <All right. laughs> I'm gonna, i'll answer more questions soon i want to get through the rest of it. there's not many things left so this is what uh the school social works website looks like right now so if you go to the front page of the school of social work we've got this big voting and social work banner you can click on it and there's uh all, there's a list of all kinds of events that are relevant for our students alum uh anybody in the social work community and the university community uh the school of social work uh has been doing a great job um at putting making sure that students and faculty and staff understand how important it is to be engaged in this um, so i'd say check that out 
Question time. Oh, got another question. All right. Do you have a plan to vote? Why am I asking about that? Do you have a plan to vote? What does that mean? These are coming in very fast, and I think you will be very happy with the results. Okay, good. Um, I'll give you guys a few more seconds. We do have one person in the chat, um, two people in the chat that have already, three people in the chat that have already voted. Someone voted from Belgium. That's great. They've executed their plan. That's good. Yes. All right. We're going to end the poll. And here are the results. Wow. Everybody has a plan to vote or already voted. OK, well, this is a good crowd. I like, I like this crowd. OK, well, so I don't really need to talk about making a plan uh, other than make sure you are talking to other people about making their plan. So if you're in Michigan, I mean, this is going to differ depending on the state. And we can send resources about this, too. But if you're in Michigan, many of you already voted or you do have the plan to vote, you can vote in person on election day or before. Uh, so I mean, that's also considered absentee voting. Like you go to your local clerk's office, get in the little voting booth and vote right now and get your sticker. Um, or you can vote by mail. At this point, if you have your absentee ballot, you shouldn't put it in the mail. Uh, you should drop it off at your at the clerk's drop box or take it into the clerk's office. Uh, right now with the way the mail is, it's not, there's no guarantee that they'll get it by election day. Um, and depending on the state that you're in, it may be, uh, they may accept ballots after their, uh, their postmark before the election up to a certain time after. I wouldn't want to risk it, especially with how consequential this election is uh, and all of the direct assaults against our democracy and the post office. So I would say at this point, if you have an absentee ballot and you haven't put it, if you haven't mailed it already, just go drop it off the clerk's office. Um, when you're thinking about coming up with a plan to vote, you want to pick a specific time and your method of transportation. Uh, and of course, be informed. There's a lot of stuff on the ballot that you might not have uh, expected to be on there. Um, so vote411.org is the League of Women Voters nonpartisan voter uh, information website. It's a fantastic website where you can get uh, information on all the candidates uh, that are on your ballot and the ballot initiatives that are on there. Uh, the only time when there's not information on there is if the candidate or the ballot initiative group did not provide it. So for me as a candidate, when somebody doesn't do that, it's very telling to me because it's the League of Women Voters reminds you frequently to do it. Uh, you know that it's as a candidate or people that are really involved in this, you know that the that website is used a lot by a lot of people and it's advertised by a lot of different groups. So if you don't put something on there, there might be a reason why that candidate didn't do that. So. Uh, I would, that's a good resource for nonpartisan information about a candidate or a ballot initiative. So the, the ballot initiative, I want to touch on that one again, too, because the ballot initiative, the language on a ballot initiative can be really hard to understand. Uh, and if you're going into voting and you didn't plan ahead of time to know who was on the ballot and, and think about that, uh, it's going to be hard to vote. It's going to be hard to decipher what the thing is actually saying. So definitely look into the ballot initiatives before you go into vote. Um, and keeping in mind, too, that there are a lot of things that people don't think about that are elected offices. And I'm going to make another you know, uh, pitch here for you to think about running for office if you haven't already. Because in a lot of places, your library board uh, is, is an elected office, uh, which is a great position for a social worker and thinking about how we can use libraries to expand services to people. Uh, of course, local school boards are elected. And you might be surprised what school um, district you live in. Uh, like, for example, I live in like the border uh, between two school districts. So the school district I actually live in is a school district that's mostly in Wayne County, not the, not FC community schools. Uh, yeah. Help others make a plan. We got 13 days left. Uh, it's been a wild, wild uh, period of time. We're almost there. So just help make sure everybody votes. It's, it's very important. This is, I, I'm sure I'll get a question about this too. Uh, so I'm going to preempt it. When people will say, what do you say to a person that says my vote doesn't count or voting isn't important? Well, first, the first thing I would say is, look, you can't just look at the presidential election and think that that's the only thing on your ballot because it's not. I know people that have won elections at the local level by one vote and or lost by one vote. So I mean, try telling those former candidates or currently elected officials that voting doesn't matter or that your vote doesn't matter because when people win by that margin, it really tells you something uh, that votes matter. 
And the other argument that I frequently get from people is that, well, what if I'm not in love with the two people at the top of the ticket? Just you don't really like either of them. Look, you're not trying to elect somebody to be your friend. I mean, that's that's not what you're trying to do here. I think you need to look at what both of the people on the top of the ticket are going to be doing, who they're going to appoint to these very important positions. If we're talking about president, think about all the appointments to different uh judicial positions that the president makes, as well as the cabinet positions uh, that people make, that, that they will make. So you need to think about that as well. And yeah, if there's other specific questions, I'll answer those. I think this might be the end. Any comments or questions? Yeah, that's that's the end of it. Great, now we can do Q&A. Yes, so we do have some comments, um, but I wanna encourage everyone to please put any questions or comments either in the chat and the Q&A box. Um, so while we're waiting, I'm gonna just share with you a few comments. Um, we've got a lot of people that have already voted. Um, one person is going to be voting in person on election day while they are working the polls. So Shannon, thank you for volunteering to do that. It's an important task. Um, we also, Claire Hughes um, lives in Ann Arbor and she has already voted by mail and letting us know um, that they are holding ballots to count um, until election day. Is that something you knew about Justin? Yeah. I uh, also want to say that that Shannon you just mentioned is Shannon Lane, the one that wrote that book right there that I talked about earlier. So re really recommend that book. Thanks for making it, Shannon. Uh, and so when certain votes are counted differs depending on the state. So in Michigan, we were able to just pass a law recently that uh, will allow clerks to start processing the ballots early, but not count them. So that I mean, even that is going to save a ton of time. But in some places, they can't count even the absentee votes until polls close. And that's where we get into the situation where we're gonna be looking at um, not knowing who's president potentially for you know, a week or more, who knows what it looks like. Uh, so that, I mean, that, that does happen. And it's something that, I mean, th thanks to the pandemic that there's people that so much more absentee voting, particularly in states where that probably wasn't gonna happen before, uh, that we're gonna have to figure out in subsequent elections because we're gonna have to get used to thinking about election week or month instead of day uh, because really, if you can vote well before the election, I mean, then election day, all election day is counting day. And does it really need to be counting day? It could be like results day, but it's just going to depend on how state laws change over time. Uh, we have someone else on here, Ruth. Um, Ruth edits a newsletter for vulnerable populations, um, a vulnerable population of patients, and they've encouraged them to have a safe plan. That's great. That's re is really important. Uh, there is an organization, Voter, it's, I will send it out, um, but it's healthcare workers that help their patients get uh, registered to vote. And what you can do is you can like take your, it's a QR code on a little badge that they give you. I'm looking around because I have one, but I don't think it's, I don't think I can reach it. Uh, and then it'll just help people register to vote on their phone. How do you it track your absentee ballot? Oh, sorry, you're, you give me the questions. I started looking at yeah, you can. You're welcome to do it. <laughs> Uh, so there's a question here about how do you track your absentee ballots? So depending on what state you're in, uh, your Secretary of State's website should be able to do that. If you in Michigan, if you go to michigan.gov slash vote, uh, you'll be able to track your absentee ballot there. You'll also be able to see who all of your elected officials are. Thank you, Aaliyah. You'll be able to look at uh, who all your elected officials are and you'll be able to figure out, like you'll, you'll be surprised that there are certain things that are elected that maybe you didn't know. But yeah, michigan.gov slash vote. You guys have any more questions, please do put them in the chat or in the Q&A box. It can be about anything now. Presentation is over. <laughs> or like a thing you want me to talk about too. This was the one to leave some time or space for this because there could be, I could talk about school stuff. I could talk about running for office, all of those things that are very relevant to social work. I will say this while we're waiting for more questions to come in. I really believe this, and it's not an overstatement, but I think social workers are the best prepared people to be an elected official. Because if you look at all the things that you have to learn through your social work education, which ranges from interpersonal practice, community organizing, uh, of course, policy work, political social work, uh, management of human services, program evaluation, all of that, isn't that something or all, aren't all of those skills that you would want your elected officials to have? And if they did have those skills, don't you think we'd have much better policy? So I really believe that social workers should be running for office and winning. 
we have a question um, from Mr. Bill Vanderwill. So as a field instructor, how can I stress the importance of constituent services in elected official offices? Some of my students feel it's below them. See, that's really interesting. Good to see you, Bill. Uh, it's, it's really important. I, you know, so now that I've won my primary and going to win in November, uh, I keep having this experience where I'm outside walking my dog and there is some issue that a neighbor will bring up to me. I mean, there are other issues in the neighborhood that I've been working on already, but now like it's happening more. And it's hard for me to keep track of all of those things because it's like you're running all these different projects at the same time. Just to give you some examples, in my neighborhood, there are serious issues with speeding. Uh, and like people will fly down my street or other streets in the neighborhood like 60, 70 miles an hour, which is you know, very dangerous because there's a lot of kids on the street. And even not that long ago, we had, there was a, an accident uh, in which a, a baby died because a uh, mother and child got hit by a car. Um, so, I mean, these are really serious issues. Um, and, and there are other issues. So, it's constituent service work is so important because, yeah, I mean, I'm sure the students that say that think, well, I'm just like a case manager. Well, case management is really important too. I did that for a number of years. But how, how can anybody expect for the elected officials or their teams to get anything done if they can't keep track of all the work that they're doing? Like it's, it's, really, it's really important work. Uh, every time like someone brings up one of these things to me, I keep thinking, I can't wait till I have social work interns to help me keep track of all these different projects that I'm trying to work on. Uh, and I can only imagine after I take office in January how much more uh, challenging it'll be to keep track of all of that and, and to like do follow up because it's not just, doing work to make progress on the issues, uh, you want to keep the people up to date on what's going on. So when they know you're working on it, so they're not like sitting around feeling bad or feeling uh, like their voice isn't being heard. So it's a, uh, it's a really vital role. And I'd be happy to talk to any of the students that are saying that because that's no. Nah. All right, we have two um, questions in, in the Q and A box right now. Um, can you share some tips for running for elected office? Yeah, I can share some tips. I would say uh, social workers are really, I mean, the research also shows that social workers tend to be best at running for local offices because they're used to doing that kind of work. Like how I talked about how me working for a community mental health system. Uh, and then, I mean, I didn't go into the whole, all the other things or many other things that I've done, uh, but a lot of that has been with county government. So I mean, me running for county commissioner years later is not really surprising because over time, I you know, developed a lot of expertise in working with county government. I would say that for other people, uh, think about the expertise that you developed over time and then figure out where you're best to be served at. You know, there's a lot of politicians that run for office with the intention, I'm gonna do this for a little bit, I'm gonna run for this, so then later I can do this other thing, which I mean, that's, I mean, people, that's just how politics works, unfortunately, for a lot of people. Um, I would say approach it from the perspective of where can you do the most good and where do you think you'll um, you know, be the most engaged. And so once you figure out what it is, the thing that you think you should run for uh, and where you can do the most good, I mean, then we come up with a plan after that. Uh, and I would say for anybody on the call, feel free to shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. I mean, this is one of the things that I try to make available to the people in, the, in my certificate program with the, um, the one hour where they're required to talk to me. I tell people they can come talk as much as they want, like every, every time we offer it. Because uh, I really want, I'm serious about getting people to, do this. Like I made a career shift from clinical social work to academia and then running for office because I, I deeply believe that we need more social workers in office. Um, so anybody that's seriously thinking about it um, or, or we just want to talk about it further, uh, shoot me an email, we'll talk about it. Um, there was actually a comment earlier that someone who commended your passion um, and how you were really led by your passion um, in this field. Um, that is evident in the comment you just made as well. No, oh, thank you. Um, and very passionate. <laughs> so another question looks like it's more of a clarifying question. Um, someone is, they're always confused by the term ad valerum. Uh, okay. I think, I mean, that's referring to thinking about like the putting value on different work or, or, or goods. Is that kind of where that's coming from? Uh, Brenda, do you want to give us some more um, insight onto that question? So while we are waiting for that, um, I will move on. So how are you and others working to encourage underrepresented folks to get interested in elected office? For example, I love the New American Leaders Project. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the work at the School of Social Work is doing that when we think about, and of course, as much as I'm talking about running for office and encouraging social workers to run for office, we need people doing work all over the place. We need social workers engaged politically in all the areas uh, of political practice. So what we're, when we're thinking about getting underrepresented groups involved, social workers should already be doing a lot of great work with underrepresented groups. Um, I mean, so of course, providing information through the work that you're already doing as a social worker, uh, New American Leaders is a great organization. So we're I mean, making people aware of those, that work that's there too. Um, outside of like sharing your experience or sharing my experience, I mean, that's one of the things that I'm doing. Like I, I do a lot of work talking to youth that are interested in political engagement and, and how they can get involved. Um, I mean, I think that's that's one step, like making making it clear to people that this is a viable thing to do and that they can do it is really helpful, I think. Another question, um, would it be possible to be alerted of decisions being made that are important to social workers so we can imp provide input in a timely manner? Um, a suggestion was perhaps through alumni fire um, Justin, I'm not sure if you have seen Alumni Fire. It's our new alumni networking platform um, that the school has. Yeah, I don't know if Alumni Fire could do that because, I mean, actually Alumni Fire people about that one specifically. But I would say that, yes, I mean, you are able to, you could sign up for bill alerts on the legislature's website if you track where certain bills are going. But also the NASW does a very nice job of uh, providing membership updates on this is where a certain bill is at. This is like the work that NASW is doing around advocacy related to the bill. Um, so those, I know sometimes they go to people's promotions or the updates folder in your email, but you should read those if you get those emails from the NASW. If you don't get their emails, you're not a member, you can still check their website because they put that information on there. Or, I mean, there are plenty of other websites besides the Michigan legislature's website uh, where you can set that up, where you can set up getting notifications on that. I think that answered the question. I think I did. Uh, and then Brenda responded with the follow up. I would say, yeah, that, I mean, that language is really confusing and it means nothing to people that are not, I mean, either writing it, it probably doesn't even mean anything to the people that are writing it because those um, ballot initiatives have to get approved. So, what I would say, that's where a lot of the value comes in and engaging directly with the people that put the ballot initiative on or made, wrote the proposal and then got it on the ballot uh, because they're going to have a breakdown of what like economically all of that is, would, would do for um, or not for or against the state. Um, and you can look at the opposing groups too. Just like how when you're researching candidates and you go to the candidate's website, uh, the ballot initiatives, there's typically the pro and the anti-ballot initiative group. If we think about why we have so many like this advancement in voting rights, we have it because of the voters, not politicians group, uh, because they did a, just an incredible job doing it. And there were people that were trying to stop them. Uh, so I mean, looking at both of those websites would be helpful. I, I would just say just general practice, don't try to read the ballot, the language on the ballot initiative to try to make your decision. You should read it, but you gotta do a whole bunch of other outside research too. Oh, we have a really good question that just came in in the Q&A box. Um, do we have any stats on how many political elected elected officials have in MSW? Um, that, that number is really hard to get. So I know the NASW tries to keep track of social workers in elected offices, which, the, I mean, and they have a list on their website, but it's not accurate because what they've looked at are people that are licensed because, I mean, that's the easiest way because you can look at the licensure database for all these other states or for states and then see who has who's a licensed social worker. But there are plenty of people that are MSWs that are not licensed that are clearly going to be bringing a social work perspective to their elected office. Uh, so it's really hard to get that number. And I, I was surprised recently um, to meet some social workers or people that have MSWs that are library, elected library board members. Uh, so that was a surprise I mean, because people aren't advertising. Like if people aren't advertising their degrees or their, their training, then you're not gonna really know. So that's unfortunate. Your question specifically was about how many staffers that are social workers. That's even harder. I gave you the example about the elected officials because I mean, that's hard enough. You would think that'd be easier, uh, but it's, it's hard to tell. It, the number is increasing though. We are getting more social workers that are working in elected offices. I'm put the blinds up and start in my eye. Yeah. All right. And one just came in. 
Oh, Shannon just asked, I did, uh, yeah, I did not mention the campaign school yet. So the campaign school um, is a, and voting and social work project. Yeah, we'll mention both of those. Um, so campaign school is a two day event uh, that's put on um, by the Nancy Humphreys Institute for Political Social Work. Uh, and it's been at Connecticut usually, but it's other, UConn uh, usually, but we did one in Michigan not that long ago. March, was it? No, it wasn't this year. It was this year. Wow, that, that seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, where you get like a two-day crash course on how to run for office for social workers, um, which is fantastic. And so there's that resource, the Voting and Social Work Project, where we got that branding from that's on the School Social Work website right now that says Voting and Social Work. Uh, there's a ton of resources on that website, which we can share too with the follow-up email that we send, where it's great resources for field sites, schools of social work, uh, all, all of that. Yep. Yep, and our camp, Michigan campaign school was in February before the last event before the pandemic. Wow. Yep. So voting and social work and campaign school. CRISP too. So um, I'm on the board of CRISP and they do a political, it's called the political boot camp. Uh, and that's like a four or five day training. And that one's, a, it's all these different training programs are a bit different. So like the campaign school does like a two day intensive training on running for office. Uh, CRISP does some campaign, like running for office work, but you also get to hear from a lot of different um, like experts in the field. Like last time they got a bunch of people from the Obama administration to come talk to people. And then you have the online certificate program that I direct, which you, you saw all the topics on that. Uh, and that's that one's online. Um, I believe that's the only online political social work training program. Um, so all of them are great. I participate in all of them, so it's good. Other question. So we've got about seven minutes left. If you guys have any other final questions um, for Justin, please um, send them our way. It's been a really good group. A lot of good questions. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that people will will engage. And if you're in a political setting right now and you don't have social work interns, I hope that you'll take them. I mean, the school has been really good about making sure that we have people that can provide secondary field instruction. Uh, so for example, we have students that are in Senator Jeff Irwin's office, who's not a licensed social worker, but takes our students. Uh, and then I provide field supervision for them. Um, Bill is on the call. He provides field supervision for students. So we find a way if you're in a macro placement where you don't have a licensed social worker. But again, if you're in Michigan, I would just say, you know, I recommend getting the license so you can take, take students on your own and help us get more social workers in macro settings. Like we oh. did just get. Oh, you got a question? Give yeah. me a question. Yep. Okay. Um, what are some examples of entry level political social work positions? It's a good question. I mean, I think a lot of them working for state legislators are good examples of entry level ones. Um, and frequently, people that help with their campaign end up getting those kinds of jobs. And um, we've got one of my students that did the internship with um, state senator's office got hired after it. So, I mean, that's a good way right into it. Um, also working for advocacy organizations, which we try to have field placements there too. Those are good ones. And policy analyst positions at some think tanks would be good. Those are good ones. Motivating, all right. That's what I like to hear. That's what I'm trying to do. Good, thank you, thank you. Oh, and yes, to give the plug, if you're a field instructor, you get free CEs through the office. That's great. I don't know how that translates into participation in the certificate programs, but I think you at least get a discount in those. So you may want to do that and then take the political social work continuing education certificate program. Correct. There's a discount offered for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. They, they have to make a profit. That's, that's, that's how they keep the, the lights on for the school. I know you mentioned um, Senator Chang earlier, who is also an alum of our school, but I wanted to mention in case you guys missed it, um, last night, she was an alumni panelist on our alumni um, spotlight panel, and we will be posting that on the website, and I encourage you to check it out, um, hearing also about her inspiring journey into politics as a social worker. No, I'm really glad to see that so many more people are paying attention to social workers being in politics and are encouraging people to do that. Uh, it's much needed right now, and you know, regardless of how the next 13 days go, uh, there's going to be a great need for social work and trying to, I think, protect and secure our democracy, uh, but also in just helping, you know, 
helping people, you know, reform and rebuild after a lot of the challenges people have faced through the pandemic, economically, and other things that I think uh, I don't like coming from the federal government. I'll just say it that way. I try to be as nonpartisan as I can be when at school. And when I'm not here. Um, and it looks okay. like you have inspired um, one of our retired alums, Gabrielle Usuli, um, to research involvement on a community level. That's fantastic. Fantastic. The other nice thing about, you know, well, we can't do it because of the pandemic, or you probably could, but, uh, you know, if you're engaged locally and doing work around or folks in what, what your local elected officials would, are doing, you run into them at the grocery store often. I run into some of them a lot. Uh, or people will run into me. And after, you know, after I lost that election in 2018, uh, I kept running into people and they like, thought I won. So they would tell me all these problems. I'm like, I can't do anything about that. I didn't win. But uh, it's, it's a great way. I mean, you're going to see that these people are more present in your community than you probably realize. And again, to Bill's point, now, when I'm in office in January, all the more need for cons constituent service people uh, that are working with elected officials because you're always going to be hearing about things that need to be done. And it's hard to keep track of all of them. You're welcome, Juliet. Thank you for coming. This is great. It's a good time. Well, if there are other questions that people, because I know we're running out of time, so fire off any last questions you have. But if there are other questions that you think of later, uh, always happy to answer questions. Uh, keep an eye out. I think many alums still get emails from the school. Um, I'm doing a watch party about voter suppression. That's another topic I could talk for a really long time about, but we don't have time to do it today. It's only got three minutes. Um, but we're going to be doing a watch party about on Rigged. It's a movie that covers voter suppression uh, next Tuesday. Yes. So, yep, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday? Next Tuesday. Yep. And you're all welcome to come to that. Um, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll share the link, too. We'll share the link to the watch party when that happens, too. So we're gonna, it's gonna use this platform um, that's kind of like Netflix party where people can watch the video together and there's a chat box and they can leave comments. Um, and then after that, we'll do a brief debrief and discussion of the, the movie on Zoom. I also encourage people, oh, you got a question? Oh no, I was gonna just chime in, but I interrupted you. So please continue. <laughs> I was gonna say, I would encourage you too to look at the democracy and debate theme semester website that the university has um, put up. Uh, people remember we were gonna host the first presidential debate, but then we didn't, uh, but the university decided to continue with democracy and debate theme. So there's a lot of great resources on there. Uh, one of the ones that I think are the most interesting are these democracy toolkits, uh, democracy cafe toolkits, which give you resources on a bunch of different topics and a lot of thought provoking questions. Uh, my team did one on voting rights and who should have the, it's called who should have the right to vote. And you look at felony disenfranchisement across the country, how that differs, uh, how some states limit the right to vote for individuals with disabilities or, or barriers that they make them face. Uh, and then we look at some things that are more hopeful, like states that are looking at or have already made it so 16 and 17 year olds can vote in local and state elections, and then some states that allow non-citizens to vote in local and state elections. So there's uh, information on all those things and good thought provoking questions that you can uh, hopefully engage with people that you know or people that you don't know and maybe across political divides. So the Democracy and Debate theme semester, Democracy Cafe, check it out. Go ahead. That sounds good, Justin. Uh, this is Aaliyah chiming in from CE, just to remind you all that we will be distributing an evaluation after the session and you will receive your certificate electronically upon completion of that evaluation. Um, usually we try to get that out to you within a, day, a business day or so of the session. So keep an eye on your inbox over the next couple of days for that. And we will be distributing the recording and the other resources mentioned um, as soon as we're able to get those together for you. Usually that also occurs within a few business days. Um, I think that that's it for me. To Julia's question, we will send the uh, watch party information out in the email that Aaliyah just mentioned. I don't know why I'm pointing all around because everybody's in a different place on your screen. But for me, Aaliyah is that way. You're probably pointing at someone. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, everyone, um, for attending. If there are no more questions um, for Justin, that is all we have for today. Um, and if you haven't uh, registered, we do have another session this afternoon um, with Abigail Eiler. 
It will be at 4.30. Um, but thank you so much, Justin. That Thank was you. a fantastic presentation.